so our next speaker, everyone, is, is uh, Corey Clark. She's the um, anticoagulation clinic coordinator at St. John Regional Hospital in New Brunswick. She's also the pharmacy re residency coordinator. She actually, interestingly, com completed her BSc pharmacy um, at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy, followed by a residency at Boston Medical Center. So I'd love to hear the story about why she came to Canada. Uh, she then served two years anticoagulation monitoring service at Boston Medical Center and moved to New Brunswick in 1996 and has practiced as an anticoagulation clinical pharmacist. So we're really excited to hear Corey talk to us about perioperative anticoagulation management. Welcome, Corey, and thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I'll just request control here and we'll see if I have any luck. It does say I have control, but I'm not having any luck here. Okay, maybe Holly, I'll get you to do the same thing if you don't mind. Okay, so these are my disclosures. Um, so I have received an honoraria for speaking for, from Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer. Next slide, please. So for today, um, at the end of our session, what I'd like to do is to be able to review the most recent literature on perioperative anticoagulant management, as well as the current recommendations. And then at the end to present a few, a couple of patient cases to develop perioperative plans to sort of see the process of, of everything we go through today. Next slide. So just to give you a little bit of background about our anticoagulation clinic here in St. John, um, the clinic is managed by pharmacists, nurses, and, and of course the hematologists. Um, the day-to-day -day operations, we manage about 600 patients, uh, mostly chronic warfarin management, but we also initiate and educate on uh, direct oral anticoagulant therapy. Um, the bulk or a, a good portion of what we do are perioperative recommendations around um, patients who are on anticoagulant. So not just the patients that we manage currently, but also the patients that are managed in the community and they're looking for um, some recommendations. So when we look at um, what we're considering um, in the perioperative phase on a, for a patient who's on an anticoagulant, we're going to evaluate thrombosis risk. So that's primarily patient characteristics. So why are they on the anticoagulant? Do they have venous thromboembolism? Are they on it for atrial fibrillation? So mostly patient characteristics for thrombosis risk. For hemorrhagic risk, it's driven mostly by the procedure itself, although we will consider certain patient characteristics. Um, and then we're gonna finally consider what anticoagulant the patient is on. Are they on warfarin? Are they on a direct oral anticoagulant? Or on the, are they on an antiplatelet? So how do we figure these different categories out? So the um, Scientific and Standardization Committee of ISTH provided a, a guidance document that was published in July of 2019. So it really helps us to stratify, stratify the, the risk of um, the hemorrhagic risk as well as the thromboembolic risk of these patients. So a lot of the information that I'll talk about today is based on that. Next slide, please. So really what we're doing here in the perioperative period is we're managing thromboembolism versus hemorrhage. So when we look at thrombosis risk, we're talking, the American College of Chest Physicians have suggested a risk stratification. So a high, moderate, and low risk stratification of thromboembolism. So to be in a high risk category, about 10%, of, greater than 10% per year um, of arterial thromboembolism, or greater than 10% per month venous thromboembolism risk. So this is the high risk folks. So a person with a mechanical heart valve um, in the mitral position 
So any mechanical valve in the mitral position is a high risk person. Um, if the valve is in the aortic position and is a caged ball or tilting disc valve, then they would also be in that high risk category. If the patient is on anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, they would be in the high risk category if they had a CHAD score of five or six or a CHADS VAS score of seven. If they've had a stroke or TIA within the last three months um, or a rheumatic valve disease. So all those folks would be in that high risk thromboembolism category. For venous thromboembolism, um, if they have protein C, S, or any thrombin deficiency, and a phospholipid antibodies, multiple thrombophilias, a vena cava filter, or active cancer. And in active cancer, it's really um, specifics. So particularly uh, pancreatic cancer, myeloproliferative disorders, brain or gastric cancers. So those folks with those types of cancers and a venous thromboembolism will be in your high risk category. Next slide. So a moderate risk would be a patient that would have a four to 10% per year risk of arterial thromboembolism or four to 10% per month of venous thromboembolism. So again, the same three categories, mechanical heart valve, atrial fibrillation, and venous thromboembolism. So a, a moderate risk for a heart valve would be a bileaflet bi aortic valve with major factors for stroke. So things like hypertension, advanced age, anything that you're gonna find in a CHAD score. So, um, for atrial fibrillation, a CHAD score of three or four, or CHAD's VAS score of five or six will put you in that moderate category. For venous thromboembolism, um, the, if you had VTE in the last three to 12 months, you'd be a moderate risk. A recurrent VTE, a non-severe thrombophilia, so something like factor V Leiden, where um, it predisposes you to first clot, but not necessarily subsequent clots, and other active cancers or a recent history. So other than the, the four high risk that I had mentioned. So low risk throm thromboembolic um, risk is less than 4% per year for arterial and less than 2% per month for VTE. So those are the folks with a mechanical heart valve in the aortic position that's bileaflet without any risk factors for stroke. So essentially a CHAD score of zero. Arterial fib or atrial fibrillation with a CHAD score of zero to two or CHADS VASC one to four. Um, and that's important to note no prior stroke or TIA. And venous thromboembolism is a low risk um, if the clot is greater than 12 months old. Um, so we're gonna do the same thing with the risk of hemorrhage. So we're gonna look at patient-specific risk. So things that you can do to assess patient-specific risk other than, you know, if they've blatantly had a recent bleed, um, but you can do a HasBlood score. Um, so for anyone not familiar with the HasBlood um, scoring system, it, uh, it evaluates folks that are taking anticoagulants and primarily warfarin is the validated, it was validated with warfarin um, with atrial fibrillation. Um, and you essentially score folks um, a point for um, hypertension, abnormal renal or liver function, um, a prior history of stroke, um, prior bleeding, if uh, a labile INR, so one that fluctuates tremendously, age greater than 65, um, and um, prior alcohol or drug uses that might predispose you to bleeding. So a score, a has blood score of three or higher would, would be a high bleed risk. Um, then from there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stratify, stratify the procedural bleed risk. And again, we're going to look at categories of high bleed risk, a low moderate bleeding risk, and a minimal bleeding risk. And I'll explain those. So a high bleed risk procedure is gonna be one that puts the patient at a 30 day risk of major bleed, so greater than 2%. And these are the surgeries that are listed here with a high bleeding risk. And I won't go through them all, but you can get a sense of, of the types of surgery that are gonna be high bleeding risk. Next slide. So a low moderate bleeding risk is a 30 day risk of a major bleed between zero and 2%. So things like arthroscopy, um, colonoscopy with or without biopsy, um, hemorrhoidal surgery. So those sorts of things are a low moderate 
bleeding risk. And the minimal bleeding risk um, are really a 0% 30-day major bleed. So minor dermatological procedures, minor dental procedures like extractions, pacemaker insertions, all of these procedures um, can be done while still on the anticoagulant. So that's important to note. Not everything do we have to interrupt the anticoagulant for. So once we've assessed the thromboembolic risk as well as the bleed risk, now we need to think about which anticoagulant the patient is on. Are they on a vitamin K antagonist, a direct oral anticoagulant, or an antiplatelet agent? So I'm gonna just quickly touch on antiplatelet agents. So aspirin, clopidogrel, and prasugrel, or ticagrelor. Um, so these agents, um, I always caution folks to, to be sure, we, we tend to think of them as relatively benign or chronic, uh, but we really need to evaluate whether or not the antiplatelet agents can be stopped at all. So is it, are, why are they on it? Are they on it for a new stroke? Are they on it for a PCI? How new is the stent? Um, and can, can they even be stopped? If they can be stopped, then um, the next slide will, uh, will give us a guide. So we need to think about the pharmacology of these agents. So remember aspirin inhibits platelets for the length, the life of the platelets. So we need to stop aspirin seven to 10 days prior to any procedure. Again, if it's okay. Um, clopidogrel and prasugrel are five to seven days into Kegelor would be five days. Next slide. So I'm gonna switch back to um, the, the anticoagulants. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the BRIDGE trial. So the BRIDGE trial is a perioperative bridging of anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation. And prior to the BRIDGE trial, there wasn't a whole lot of data for us. It was, there were some observational studies and some observations, and they mostly led us to the conclusion that perhaps um, bleeding might be an issue um, for patients who are bridged in, in the interruption for anticoagulants, um, but it was a bit gray as far as, you know, are they at a higher risk of thromboembolism? So the BRIDGE trial was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and it looked at patients who were on warfarin for AFib and required a perioperative interruption. Bridging was provided with deltaparin versus no bridging, which was a matched placebo. Uh, 1,184 patients were enrolled, and the primary outcome was arterial thrombosis and major bleeding. Secondary outcomes looked at death, MI, DVT, PE, and minor bleeding. The summary of the results, so the primary outcome showed that no bridging um, was not inferior to bridging for arterial thromboembolism. So there was no difference between stroke TIA and systemic embolism. However, for major bleeding, there was superiority of no bleeding over brid of no bridging over bridging. So it looks like when we obviously when we don't give an anticoagulant, they don't bleed as much. The secondary outcome, looking at death MI, DVT, and PE, um, they were essentially all the same. Um, and again, we saw some superiority, superiority with minor bleeding. So in conclusion of the trial, they decided that patients with AFib and a warfarin interruption for an elective procedure, no bridging was non-inferior to bridging in patients in the prevention of arterial thromboembolism. No bridging was superior to bridging with regard to major bleeding. Um, and we also saw that with, some, with minor bleeding. So what did this mean for our patients? Um, really, it, in my clinic for sure, it meant less low molecular weight heparin bridging for patients who are taking warfarin. So if we had done an evaluation on a patient and they had had a stroke, even if that stroke was 10 years ago, we would bridge them because we were afraid of having that second stroke in a short interruption. And the bridge trial really provided us with the data um, to support that it's, safer to not bridge that, that particular patient. So when we're looking at uh, pre-procedure um, thoughts on 
patients on anticoagulants, these are the things, the questions that we should be asking. Can the anticoagulant be continued? Can the anticoagulant be discontinued? What if the patient had had a, it had, had a new clot? Can we actually stop that anticoagulant? What's the thromboembolic risk? What is the patient-specific bleed risk? And what is the procedural bleed risk? So we're gonna do this with every patient that we evaluate. So we often get questions about, oh, can I have your protocol for, for bridging patients? And it's really not existent because every single time we're going to evaluate a patient um, asking these questions. And even from one patient in one period of time to the next period of time, things may have changed. So we're going to do this process over and over again. Next slide. So when we're looking at an interruption, it's important to remember the pharmacology of the anticoagulants. So when you look at warfarin, um, we're generally looking at a five-day hold for a pre-procedure um, preparation. And the reason for this is if you look at the half-life, the half-life of warfarin, and that's the drug itself, is 40 hours. So with warfarin, we also have to consider the half-life of the, the clotting factors that it inhibits. So if you look at factor two, which is thrombin, it has the longest half-life, which is 24 hours. So we not only have to think about the half-life of the drug, but the half-life of the factors that it's inhibiting. And just to note that the renal elimination for warfarin is less than 1%. When you're evaluating the direct oral anticoagulants, you'll see that the half-life of these agents are significantly shorter. Um, so that allows us to stop it in a shorter period of time. Um, but what we're gonna consider with the direct oral agents are the, the renal elimination. So when you're looking at dabigatran, you know, it's 80% renally excreted. And, and um, Adoxaban's 50%, Apixaban 25%, and Rivaroxaban 33%. So, so there is some variation there. So if we're going to look at warfarin, um, we're going to hold warfarin five days preoperatively. Then we're going to decide whether or not to bridge with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And we're going to resume 12 to 24 hours postoperatively. So for low or moderate bleed risks, it's 12 to 24 hours. For a high bleed risk procedure, it's gonna be 48 to 72 hours post-op. So what about the direct oral agents? Um, really, we're doing the same thing as the warfarin. We're looking at the bleed risk, we're looking at the thromboembolic risk, but now we're gonna look at the half-life of the drug, but also the renal clearance of the drug. But for these agents, because the, the interruption is so short, there is no bridging with low molecular weight heparin. To look specifically at dabigatran and its preoperative interruption, um, because it's different from the other three, um, if a patient has a creatinine clearance that's over 80 mils per minute and having a low risk bleed surgery, you can hold the dabigatran 24 hours prior to the surgery. If it's a high-risk bleed surgery, then it's 48 hours. The creatinine clearance is 50 to 79 mils per minute, then you're gonna hold the dabigatran for a low-risk bleed surgery um, 36 hours prior or 72 hours if it's a high risk. And then when you get down to a creatinine clearance between 30 and 49, you're gonna be looking at a low-risk bleed surgery of holding that agent about 48 hours pre-op and a high-risk bleed surgery up to 96 hours pre-op. So that's a little different. The timing of a Pixaban, Adoxaban, and Rivaroxaban um, are lumped together. So if, they're, if the patient's creatinine clearance is greater than 30 mils per minute, you're gonna hold 24 hours ahead for a low bleed risk or 48 hours for a high bleed risk. So it's a little bit easier. Um, if their creatinine clearance is 15 to 29, you're gonna hold 36 hours for a low-risk bleed and 48 hours for high-risk bleed surgery. Now, with a low-risk bleeding surgery, the direct oral agents can be added back on six, as early as 68 hours after surgery. So as long as the patient is not bleeding and hemostasis has been um, restored. If it's a high-risk bleeding surgery, then perhaps you need to delay that um, restart of the direct oral agents for 48 to 72 hours. 
um, or if the patient has had a bleed. Um, but in that period of time, if you're getting on three days, four days, perhaps you want, you're going to want to consider thromboprophylaxis, so something like a low molecular weight heparin at a thromboprophylaxis dose. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just to illustrate some of these points with uh, a couple of cases. And the first one is in um, a really interesting fellow. He is, I think, one of my favorites. He's an 80-year-old uh, male who was referred to the clinic for perioperative recommendation. And he, so he wasn't a patient that we normally managed for his warfarin, um, but he was having an upcoming biopsy and excision of a low rectal mass. His past medical history was um, significant for atrial fibrillation. He had two previous strokes, the last being in 2015. He has osteoarthritis, hypertension, um, benign prostatic hypertrophy, Bell's palsy, and allergic rhinitis. So his meds are listed here. So as you can tell, he's on warfarin. Um, and so we need to develop a plan for, for what this fellow is going to need. Um, so his creatinine clearance calculates to 37 mils per minute at the time. His CHAD score is four. So we calculated that based on his age, uh, prior stroke, and hypertension. Based on the procedural bleed risk, he's got a moderate bleed risk, so which translates it's roughly to a two-day risk of major bleed. Now his thrombosis risk is also moderate based on his CHAD score of four. So when you use the Thrombosis Canada um, perioperative tool and you plug this fellow in, he comes up as moderate. Um, so moderate risk for bleed, moderate risk for thrombosis. So those folks are a little bit tricky. So it, it says, you know, you can bridge and maybe, but it's okay if you don't as well. So at that point, that's when we look at patient-specific characteristics. So because he had two strokes, um, it made us a little bit nervous. So you don't have another, you don't have a way to calculate that into the CHAD score. It's only, you know, you get one value for a stroke. So that third stroke, if he was potentially to have, could be debilitating. So that was a characteristic that we took under um, advisement. Um, his rectal mass was also suspect for cancer, so that was another thromboembolic risk. When we calculate his, his HASBLED score, his HASBLED was 2, so he wasn't a high risk for bleed. Next slide. So what is the perioperative plan for this fellow? And like I said, each plan is going to be tailored to that particular patient. Next slide. So obviously what we're going to do is we're going to hold the warfarin pre-procedure. So five days is the normal duration to make sure that we clear the warfarin for the half-life of the agent as well as the half-life of the, the clotting factors. We did decide to bridge him with a low molecular weight heparin. So the regimen for that was, is a full, day, full dose low molecular weight heparin that starts day three pre-op. And it's given day three pre-op and day two pre-op and then a half dose on day one. Um, there's nothing on the day of the procedure, and then we resume both warfarin and low molecular weight heparin 24 hours post-op as long as hemostasis is achieved. And we continue them together until the INR is two or greater. Next slide. So this fellow was very interesting, like I said. And during his um, time with us, when he was on the low molecular weight heparin by itself, he noticed that a rash that he was struggling with um, had, had gotten significantly better. So he began to think that that might have been the re from the warfarin. Um, normally, we wouldn't really expect warfarin to cause a rash, but it's possible, but you don't see it very often. But it was convincing enough and he had improved enough that we thought, oh, okay. So despite him not being our patient, we switched him to a Pixivan. So, um, and he did do better. His rash did improve and um, of course, a pixel, and now we had the ability in to have to get it covered for him. So in New Brunswick, um, the oral anticoagulants um, are not covered right off the hop unless you've had a trial of warfarin or there's some adverse reaction or reason why we can't use warfarin. So now we had that argument as well. So we put him on a pixaban five milligrams BID. And uh, so a month later, we, he crosses our desk again, and now he has to have an excision of anal warts. 
Um, so we, we go through the process again on the same patient. Next slide. So this time is creatinine, calcul calculate, creatinine clearance calculates to 42 mils per minute. His CHAD score is still four. The procedural bleed risk for this procedure is moderate. Um, and the thrombosis risk is moderate, also still based on his CHAD score. Now we are able to remove the other patient specific characteristics because his um, previous surgery was, it ended up not being malignant. So we're, we're left with the two strokes. And of course now he's on a Pixaban. So significantly easier to manage. Next slide. So his instructions this time around were to hold the Pixaban 24 hours pre-procedure and resume 24 hours post-procedure. Um, the next case I wanted to use is, a, is also an, um, an interesting fellow that we've managed in clinic. So he's a 56-year-old male um, with a history of DVT in 2013. He's homozygous for factor V Leiden, but no other significant past medical history, and his only medication is warfarin. And now he's scheduled for a hernia repair. Um, so his perioperative plan is um, his bleed risk is moderate for the procedure, his patient-specific bleed risk is low, and his thromboembolic risk is low to moderate. Next slide. So for him, we're going to hold warfarin five days pre-op, as usual, no low molecular weight heparin bridging for this particular fellow. And then we're going to restart warfarin the evening of surgery if hemostasis is achieved. If the patient is admitted to hospital, um, then VT prophylaxis would be provided until the INR is therapeutic. But for this fellow, he was not. Um, so in summary, for patients who are on anticoagulants, um, they really need individual consideration when dealing with an interruption for procedures. So both hemorrhagic and thromboembolic risks need to be evaluated, and we need to look to current guidelines and Thrombosis Canada tools to help us with determining the best perioperative plan. Um, and I will uh, take any questions. Thanks, Corey. That was great. We have one question actually from Rita. Uh, why do you do a half dose of low molecular weight heparin the day before? Um, that's a, we, we dose the, the half dose of low molecular weight heparin the day before in order to ensure that the low molecular weight heparin is truly cleared um, at the time of surgery. So to, to diminish that risk of bleed. Okay, thank you for pointing out the Thrombosis Canada app because I also find it very, very useful. So really, really appreciate that. That was a great talk. Uh, we have another minute or two for questions if anyone has any questions with Corey. Okay, Corey, that was great. Thank you so much. Actually, we have another question, Corey. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. When you say hold for 24 hours, does that mean that the last dose is on day minus two pre-op, right? Holding That's 48 correct. hours is the last day minus three. Right, so the day of surgery is zero. The day before surgery is day minus one, so 24 hours. So the last dose right. would be two days out. Right, and if you, um, if you give a full dose the morning before and there's a 24-hour gap between that and the OR, is that okay? It is okay. Yeah, so we just want to ensure that 24 hour gap. Um, but often, you know, your surgery and the dosing time of the low molecular weight heparin, they don't align to that 24 hours. So that half dose tends to accommodate for that. Okay, thank you very much, Corey.